I had exertional rhabdomyolysis for this assignment. So first off, I just wanted to kind of break down what exertional rhabdomyolysis is, since it's a big, big word. So the first word, pretty simple, exertional, having to do with physical or perceived use of energy, so basically physical activity, or exercise. Now, rhabdomyolysis. So first off, rhabdo, kind of, I looked up, it kind of means rod, or it has something to do with your striated and muscle. Myo, meaning muscle, and less meaning damage or death. So when you put those terms together, you get the breakdown and death of muscle tissues and cells after physical activity. So you typically see these in response to repetitive or prolonged exercise in hot environments or in individuals who are out of shape and like try to push themselves through a workout. So it's typically seen in individuals who are going through preseason. We actually had a case here. I talked to one of our athletic trainers. They said that they saw it this preseason in one of our athletes. Um, they were in preseason, like, went through first couple days, so their DOMS is kind of setting in, their delayed on onset muscle soreness, and they tried to push themselves through the next workout, but just ended up cramping, they weren't very hydrated, and so they saw that <clears throat> this past year, or this past preseason. So like I mentioned, it's in athletes, military personnel as well, which I found pretty interesting, and those who are unaccustomed to exercise. So those are the individuals at the greatest risk. So... <clears throat> It tends to affect your muscles, like I mentioned, your kidneys, and can affect other structures of your body. And if not treated quickly enough, it can even cause death. So it affects your muscles, which then affects your kidneys, and then can affect more if not taken uh, care of promptly. And there's another um, variation of this. It's just called rhabdomyolysis, so not having to do with physical activity. It just has to do with Crush syndrome. Um, can, can be related to sickle cell anemia, hot and cold environments, uh, and just uh, drugs or other diseases. So some signs and symptoms. These are going to happen uh, following physical activity or exercise because we are dealing with the exertional rhabdomyolysis, not just regular my rhabdomyolysis in this case. So you're going to see pain, swelling, weakness in the muscles, um, Depending on the severity, if it's very bad in the later stages and, like, they've been going through this for a while, they are going to have muscle cramps in a lot of places, and it's going to be very hard to control. They're going to be very weak. They're probably going to be, uh, like, this person's hunched over in the picture. They're probably, you might have to lay them down. Um, their urine's going to be dark, and they're going to have significantly elevated levels of creatine kinase, which you can't really see, but I'll get into that in a second. So some hallmark characteristics found in during a physical examination, like I said, they're going to ha have elevated creatine kinase levels, specifically five times the upper limit. So you would, I'm going to get into this in a second, but you would send them to the hospital and have this tested. And this is a major sign of them having exertional rhabdomyolysis. And like I mentioned earlier, they're going to have pain, tenderness, weakness, swelling, and cramping feeling in their muscles affected right after physical activity or exercise. So some causes. Like I said, physical activity since we're dealing with the exertional. Um, so for the muscle, damage is done to the proteins in the muscle cells, right? This creates an increase in the calcium within the muscle. This calcium inhibits the muscle from using ATP, which is how we uh, go through cellular respiration, which causes the muscle to contract. That muscle con contracting breaks down the muscle farther, and it, it doesn't let the muscle relax. So this individual is just sitting there with their, say, let's say calf cramping, and they they just can't relax it because it's not allowing them to. This there's a buildup of calcium, and they can't go through cellular respiration. So their calf is just cramping and breaking down. Now, how does this affect the kidney? Well, when the muscle breakdown occurs, it's causing your muscle to release contents into the blood. These contents are your myoglobin, your creatine kinase. So your muscle is just breaking down. It's releasing these into the bloodstream which are not usually in the bloodstream. They should not in this amount. Um, so your body has to filter these. So how do they filter them out of your body? They go through your kidney. So the kidney isn't used to filtering uh, these contents out of your body. So it affects um, it, the kidney's job, right? So you have an excess. So it basically blocks the kidney from doing its job, which creates an excess of urine, um, 
greater problems getting things out of your body. So it can actually end up affecting uh, renal and other areas of your body if it's not treated quickly. So treatment, there's actually like mild cases seen that tend to just go undiagnosed and people just treat them with hydration and rest. But in more severe cases, which um, are typically seen in very, se like, very severe muscle cramping, you got to send them to the hospital. <clears throat> like right away, you got to recognize these symptoms and send them to the hospital to get an IV mm -hmm. so they can get hydrated and bounce out their creatine kinase levels. Um, and at the hospital, they're going to check these creatine kinase levels and the urine to monitor if they're getting better or worse. And to monitor the kidney function as well, because if the kidney function gets worse, <clears throat> excuse me, then they can find out other things, other ways to treat it, such as dialysis um, or other things to help them control the muscle cramping and stop the breakdown of their muscle. So the return to play process. <clears throat> There's no evidence-based guidelines for return to play. Um, so I basically found in one of the articles I read, actually a couple, they mentioned uh, some guidelines to follow, so I just kind of based these off of that. those. So what I read was that athletes are going to be separated into high-risk and low-risk athlete categories. So for high-risk individuals, these are going to be people that had a delayed recovery, um, lasting longer than a week. Uh, they're going to have persistently high uh, creatine kinase levels, even though they have been resting. Because your creatine kinase levels increase when you exercise, so with rest, they should decrease. But in these individuals, they're going to be elevated. Uh, individuals who had renal injury, which means it affected their kidney. Uh, those who've had a family history of exertional rhabdomyolysis, muscle cramps, or sickle cell. Each of those can uh, affect this. So these individuals should be tested for myopathic disorders such as genetic testing, electromyogram, or a muscle biopsy, just to confirm for other things and to make sure they won't be at a big risk for this happening again. So those who are at low risk are those who recover quickly, uh, they have normal creatine kinase levels, no family history, and they're well trained and tend to be seen as athletes to keep up their uh, physical activity and intensity levels. So I found a pretty cool chart. It's like a th so these individuals are going to go through a three phase process, and I found a really cool chart uh, from one of my sources. I just kind of copied it over because it was really good. It <clears throat> so the three phases they're going to be phase one. It's basically just going to go through having them rest for seventy two hours, have them hydrate, get. It, uh, good night's sleep. It's going to have them just be in, <clears throat> be in a house, a neutral environment, not too hot, not too cold, and it's going to have them follow up uh, with a doctor to maintain and uh, monitor their creatine kinase levels. They go can go into phase two if everything from there is good, so they would begin light activity, no strenuous activity, just kind of like activities of daily living, maybe a little bit of walking and jogging here and there, um, just physical activity at their own pace. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're also gonna follow up with some a healthcare provider, just to make sure everything is normal. And then if everything is normal, their symptoms don't worsen. They continue to improve. They can move on to phase three, which is just gradually returning to their sport and physical training and follow up as needed. So that was basically it on extrusional rhabdomyolysis. Here's my work cited, and that's about it. Hope you guys enjoy.